Righty-o, legends. Last episode of 2023. Welcome to the New Spirit Podcast. If you are brand new here for the first time, my name is Shrek, and I get to interview spearfishing legends from around the planet. Today, we're headed to South Australia. It's Dave Schofield. He is an active member still, I believe, in the uh, in the leadership for the Gulf Skin Dive of South Australia. Mad comp Spiro. He's got kids now that are starting to spear his 13-year-old daughter, starting to rip it up. Uh, and we have a a really good lively chat today. Dave comes highly requested over several years, so it's great to finally be able to get him on the show and um, show the world, I guess, what South Australia spearing is like and what the people are like down there. He's a he's a proper gentleman too. So shout out to the guys down there in the Gulf Skin Divers. Sounds like you guys have got an awesome um, spearfishing club culture and community going down there. I'm a, I'm a little envious. Um, here in Brizzy, we we do have a couple. We've got the Toy Gold Coast Club about an hour south, and the Sunshine Coast Skin Divers are, are about an hour north. And so we do have those two clubs, and they're both actually thriving. And it's it's really good to see. I, I really love to see the the spearfishing clubs thriving because they add so much, and then, and they give us a a central point to rally around when we, you know, when we face face uh, attacks on our on our access to spearfishing grounds and things like that. And um, the social comps are a really good aspect too. If you guys are on the fence about joining one of your local spearfishing clubs, um, go and do it in the new year. And um, let's put some new blood in these clubs. And if they are, if they don't have a great culture, then get involved and get amongst it. Roll your sleeves up. And if you if you have the time and energy, um, give into it. Even if it's just for a year or two, um, they are kind of what we make them, guys. So um, anyway, just uh, a bit of grandfather Shrek. Uh, Sitting up on the soapbox today, um, I am a member, active member of the Sunny Coast Skin Divers, but I, I, I'm not involved in leadership, but uh, I love the guys that are, and I think uh, it's a cool thing. Anyway, I've harped on. Hey, massive thanks and a Merry Christmas to all you guys that listen to the podcast, um, episode by episode. I really appreciate it. And for those that go the extra mile and contribute financially, uh, the Noob Sparrow Patreon. Uh, Patreon. If you go to patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro, there's four levels that guys support the show on. It's on an episode by episode basis. Um, I'm going to look to improve that Patreon setup in the new year. If you guys have some ideas, um, particularly the patrons, because you guys are, um, you know, you go that extra mile to put fuel in the Noob Spiro outboard and keep this uh, keep this thing chugging along. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Email me, Shrek at Noob Spiro.com. But um, we're going to get into that episode in two shakes of a lamb's tail. Last, last thing before we get in there. Reed uh, recently come and did my beginner spearfishing course, and he says, I couldn't be more pleased with the spearfishing and freediving course. Isaac Shrek, Isaac or Shrek, Tom and Brandon are absolute gems when it comes to sharing their extensive knowledge, skills, and experience. Their teaching style makes you feel at ease, and their patience and excellent communication skills create a fantastic learning environment. The crew of people on the course were awesome, and what stood out was how Shrek and his team helped those who had struggled with previous freediving courses. They provided valuable tips, broke down barriers, and patiently built confidence, ensuring they comfortably passed the course. I can't recommend this course enough. Approaching the experience with an open mind and soaking up the wealth of information and skills these guys share is key. In just three days, my diving and spearfishing abilities took significant leaps forward. If you're considering this course, don't hesitate. It's well worth it. Guys, there's a couple coming up in the January and February. There's two courses there. Uh, I'd love to see you there. If you go to spearfishingcourses.com.au, you can find out about them. There is a link from noobspero.com as well. Let's get into it. Last episode of 2023. It's an absolute legend. Dave Schofield. Here we go. In a world of cancel culture, we need to be bold and stand up. Ignore the self-censorship, have a laugh and poke the bear, or in this case a shark, with Fuck the Tax Man. Listeners get a free hat of their choice when they spend over $100 at anoobspero.com forward slash taxman when they use the code anoobspero with the designs that capture the frustration of having your fish taxed. You'll love the FTTM long sleeve UV blocking fishing jerseys, t-shirts, hats and more. Visit noobspero.com forward slash taxman. Use the code noobspero to score a free hat of your choice when you spend $100 or more. Again, go to noobspero.com forward slash taxman. Ew! Adreno stocks equipment for noobers. The gear you need for all things freediving and spearfishing. The Adreno spearfishing team froth 
on helping customers learn about the latest in spearfishing equipment, local diving, upcoming trips and events for Spiros of all levels of experience. There's no ego in there. You're going to meet cool people that love this spearing lifestyle as much as you do. Visit them in store in one of their huge mega stores around Australia. Chat to one of their friendly team members. Take advantage of the Noob Spiro discount code. Save $20 on every purchase over $200 in store, online, easy savings. Pump in the code Noob Spiro if you're shopping online or in store. Mention it to one of their friendly team members and save $20 over $200. That's right, use the code Noob Spiro in store. Shop with Adreno, our partner for more than 200 episodes. Are you US based looking for freediving spearfishing gear? Neptonics is the best. Their online website so easy to use. If you've got any questions, Jerry and the team answer questions via phone, email. Anyway, they've got an easy contact form on the site. Uh, these guys are absolute legends and uh, if they sell it, they believe in it, they back it, they use it themselves. It's tough gear that works. Visit neptonics.com, use the code NOOB10 to save 10% on any order at neptonics.com. That's right, use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10 on your next order. Save 10% at neptonics.com. G'day Noob Sparrow community, welcome to another bloody awesome podcast, it's a, it's a Saturday morning here, Dave's graciously made time for me, I'm joined by the South Australian Golf Skin Divers President, he's an avid comp diver, Dave it's awesome to have you with me mate, uh, it's been a long time coming, you've been recommended by a whole bunch of people before so I'm sorry it's taken me this long. Uh, thanks so much for having me Isaac, I, I really appreciate um, you making the time to speak with me, I'm, I'm a little bit flattered to be honest. So. Mate, this South Australia, like, despite being sort of at the, the southern end of the country, people might be like, oh, it's temperate water, you know. Um, I've been there. Like, I, I've only been admittedly to Mount Gambier and sort of the carpenters there down south of it. Um, but it seems like a friggin' awesome place. The water is alive. Like, it's just this, it's so oxygen rich down there. It seems like, it seems like there's just a lot going on um, under the water in terms of food for, for fish and stuff. There, there, there really is. Um, SA's flown under the radar for quite a long time um, on the on the spearfishing scene, and I, I think it's the temperate waters. Southern Australia is is the perfect ground to um, to to learn how to how to hunt, how to how to become a better spearfisher, and it's it served me really well. Like you can, you know, if you if you're chasing big fish and in clear water and it's warm and all that sort of stuff, you know. You, you can wrap your head around that pretty easily, whereas you know down south you're sort of forced to dive in, you know, as cold as 11 degrees during winter, and and you know it gets up to about 21, 22 during summer. But and you do get clear days, you do get the the good times, but um a lot of it is is sort of a little bit a little bit chilly and a little bit miserable when you're chasing small flighty fish a lot of the time, um, which which I think is a is a great thing for for people to learn how to learn how to hunt. Um, can hunt, hunt a small flighty fish in dirty water, then you you adapt pretty quickly to, <laughs> yeah. to the warm, warm, clear, big stuff. I was going to say to you, like, I reckon some of the, the most frothy spiros I've ever spoken to are temperate, dirty water spiros because if they persist and love it, even in those conditions, the world is your oyster. Like, you're never, ever going to have a bad day out. You go anywhere and you're going to appreciate it. Some people... I feel like if they start at the other hot, the top end of the you know super clean warm water with big fish, it's almost like you know even coming home from a Great Barrier Reef trip to Brizzy, sometimes it's a little bit like anticlimactic. But you've, <laughs> there there is a level of enjoyment in every sort of type of spearfishing, I reckon. So I'm glad you sort of hit that nail on the head. Hundred hundred percent, and yeah, a lot of a lot of the fish that people might see us from South Australia shooting, you know, we're holding up a holding up a, a whiting or, a, you know, some, something something small, a mullet or, you know, anything like that. And, you know, people up north, they look at that and they go, why are they, why are they shooting bait? <laughs> <laughs> oh, whiting are like, whiting are a boogie fish for so many people. Like, I, we'll get into that. I want to talk about a few of the iconic sort of South Australia species. Plus, you've got big, beautiful southern rock lobsters down there, which I friggin' love. Um, there's a whole bunch to your fishery. It's not, it's not as... Um, it's not as straightforward as I think some people imagine. Plus, you you guys have been running an awesome comp down there in Kangaroo Island. I just want to talk a little bit about about your club. So it's the Golf Skin Diver South Australia. Um, my on noobspero.com, I've got a uh, menu up the top, and I've tried to get every spearfishing club 
that submits their details to me. So if, if people go to noobspiro.com, up in the, the community menu, and you scroll down to um, Spearfishing Club Connections, um, you will find the the the, um, the golf skin divers there. So I've got you guys down as having 70 active members, um, and you guys are pretty active on the comp scene. And it says here um, a lot of your activity is conducted conducted in either the Golf St. Vincent or Spencer Golf, and, and hence that's why you guys named it the Golf Skin Divers. Talk to me a little bit about your club and sort of um, what makes it a, a kind of special thing. Yeah, so we, we started Golf Skin Divers in 2018. Um, legendary South Australia's Bureau, Mary Ann Stacey, started a, started a small club um, back in the early 2000s just because there was, there was no – there was – a very little spear fishing scene in South Australia, um, and she she basically didn't have any any dive buddies. I had no one to go diving with, and went how do I how do I meet people? How do I? And so she started uh, a club called Free Dive Extreme, and that that was that was active for quite a few years. And that's where I came on the scene. I, I joined them, and I met I met you know Mary Ann Stacey and Sam Dawson and a, and a few of few of the other sort of um, South Aussie spearos. And but then after a few years, you know, life gets busy and and the club sort of faded out a little bit. Um, sort of by 2010, 2011, somewhere around there, I would say, I would say it would have been. Um, and we still we still ran a few comps and stuff like that through that period. Um, but between 2011 to 2018, there wasn't really a an active club in South Australia, and. A lot of the a lot of the local the, the scene was still growing the scene was still there but it, and it was getting more more and more popular over those years, um, and I, I in my head I knew that I was the right person to start the club. Everyone kept on saying, you know, you need to start you need to start a club. You need to you need to consolidate people, get everyone in the one place, and I knew I was the person to do it. But I procra- I didn't I wouldn't say that I procrastinated. I I think I, I waited for what I felt was the right time, um, both for myself and the, and the community. Because to run a club, you have to have time. You have to have the the fire in your belly and the passion and and all of that stuff to do it well. And if I was going to do it, I wasn't going to half ass it. Yeah. Um. So I, I waited and waited, and then eventually, few few life circumstances changed. And in in you know early two thousand and eighteen, I was I was working as a commercial diver out on a. Uh, a tuna tow boat out off Port Lincoln, and pretty much did did three months straight out on this boat, diving every day. You know, get catching the wild tuna and towing them back to Port Lincoln, and that <laughs> it was a pretty quiet, pretty quiet job. Um, had a lot of had a lot of time to think and prepare. And during those three months, I, I put pen to paper and basically wrote wrote down what I wanted in a club, what I wanted to get out of it, um, what I think the community needed. And I think that was that that sort of foundation, that time that I had in that period was the foundation that I needed to mentally prepare myself for what was going to come. Mm. Um, and I came I came back from that from that three months at sea, and I was I was pretty fired up. And um, yeah, and we we kicked it in the guts. And late late two thousand and eighteen, we we formed Golf Skin Divers, and um, I was at the time I was going to be pretty happy if we got to. 30 or 40 members, sort of traditionally that was, you know, I think um, Free Dive Extreme, the most they ever got to was about 25 members. So I thought if I can get roughly, you know, a little bit more than that, I'll, I'll consider it a resounding success. And pretty much within the first month, I think we had 40 or 50 members and, and it's just, it just grew. <laughs> like, you know, That's awesome, it, mate. It's it, funny awesome. Uh, it, was, it was pretty rewarding to, yeah. to see everyone um, support it and, and get together and, um, and yeah, I, I, I've got zero regrets. Yeah, and nice. It's been a fantastic thing. I think now too, it sounds like the club's taken on a life of its own. Like as a, I think the sign of a good leader is that good people thrive and come up through the ranks. Uh, but in order to get to that place, you've got to be more than a good leader. You've kind of got to be a little bit visionary in terms of planning the DNA of the club and the core values and things like that. Walk me through some of your guiding principles and the the cultural values that you guys think you have there in the golf skin divers. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, obviously life life changes. You know, my life now isn't the same as what it was in two thousand and eighteen. You know, work changes, jobs change, family change. I think it's pretty important to get a good group of guys around you, and they they showed their faces pretty early in the forming of the club. 
Um, and, and a few of them were guys that I wouldn't have necessarily picked to be the people that would be my right hand people. And, yep. but the, these core guys have, have, have stood up and when I haven't had the time, which, which has quite often happened, they've, they've just grabbed the lead and gone. And there was a time a few years ago where I considered, um, you know, like I was just too busy with with so much that was going on in life to be able to actually successfully run the club, and I spoke to the guys and said, "Look, I, I can't, I can't do this at the moment. I'm too busy. Um, I'm going to have to stand down as president. We're going to have to have to find a replacement." And um, and it was nearly a revolt on my hands. You know, the guys, <laughs> the guys were so were so off the idea. They they just said, "No, nah, we're not going to." We're basically not going to accept that. You, you, <laughs> we, we need you to stay as president, but but you know, be be the face and and stay there. But um, yeah, we'll we'll do the we'll do the lifting work, and and they've they've been true to their word. And I, I can't I can't thank you know Liam Baines, Todd Trenorden, um, Alistair Greer, um, especially those those three guys have been, and Greg Tenikoff, uh, those 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 guys have been really instrumental in in keeping this club alive and keeping it um, going the way that it's been going. So my perception of clubs, a lot of clubs can be like really um, comp centric. And I think um, having a good um, comp vibe is important to every sort of thriving club. I think it's a a great central uh, rallying point in order to have events and stuff like that. But I feel like if that's all your club's got going, then it dies a slow death. What are your thoughts on that? I would agree. Agree with that. I think comps are a, a fantastic core to get everyone together um, a few times a year. I, as much as I love a comp, I think you can overdo it. We run we run two two comps. We run a state titles and the York Peninsula Classic, um, as well as a bit of an inter club comp um, through the year. Uh, I think you you need the comps, but you also need. You need other stuff. People, not everyone's going to be a comp diver. Like I love comp diving, but there's plenty of guys in the club that, you know, it's just not their thing. And there's there's heaps of really, really good divers that you meet that just have zero interest in the competitive side of spearfishing. So I think you need to be able to cater for, for um, you know, you can't just cater for one and not the other. There has to be um, diversity within your club structure to, to do other stuff that's not just competitions. But, um, yeah. Okay. So what are some of the things away from comps that you guys have been able to sort of um, create, I guess, events around and, and to sort of bring in the newer divers and, and to keep sort of new blood coming in? Yeah, it's so obviously um, information nights just a couple of weeks ago. We had a um, the guys again, obviously I'm away working, so I wasn't involved in this one, but they, they, um, they had a bit of a, a gear night where one of the, one of the members sort of Stripped apart all the gear and went through piece by piece what what you need starting out and you know this is why you need this and this is how you, this is how your gun actually works and this is how you rig it and all of that sort of stuff and then we had a had another member who's um, who's a medic who you know had a had a tourniquet there and sort of showed showed how to uh, properly apply a tourniquet what sort of wounds whether it's a whether it's a prop strike wound that's more of a gash or a you know how to actually Dress those wounds times yeah, nice. the, times that a tourniquet might not necessarily be necessary and all that sort of stuff. So it was, you know, good educational nights like that is something that, that people always um, appreciate and seem to respond pretty well to. And and that night was that night was fantastic. Um, we do we try to do yearly. Obviously, image is a pretty big thing with spearfishing. Um, a lot of states have or a lot of spearfishing in general. Can suffer a bit of negative image um, yeah. through the sins, sins of the past, and South Australia is probably worse than many states for that. Um, so we we've done um, we do yearly beach cleanups with with nice. local um, conservation groups, and we usually try to coincide it with a with a dive as well, like do a do a do a swim and and collect some rubbish from the ocean, but also you know wear wear our club wear our club emblems and walk along the beach with bags and and you know pick up rubbish and the response from the public when you do stuff like that is is really good like yeah giving when, back when, eh? when people see a bunch of you know early guys in their early 20s or early 30s who, who would usually be probably waking up on the beach with a pile of cans nursing a hangover <laughs> these these guys are out there at, at eight o'clock in the morning bloody you know picking up the rubbish from the people the night before you know and yeah. people love that yeah and, yeah 
Yeah. And when you get talking to people and, and they go, oh, you know, you're from a spearfishing club, yeah, you, know, you can see it challenging their, yeah. <laughs> challenging their, their, their concept of what you actually represent. Yeah, good. That's a great initiative. I like it. All right, cool. Let's hmm. talk about um, let's talk about spearfishing in South Australia. And maybe starting. Um, so from my sort of brief time there, I was doing a Kilsby sinkhole retreat, which is Kilsby sinkhole is a fantastic little spot to go and have a have a dive if you if you guys ever get a chance, even if you're a hardcore spearer. And all that area you've got Ewan's ponds and Piccaninny and all those places. Water's insanely clear. It's just it's it's a cool thing you guys have got there. And then just a hop, skip, and jump away. You've got um some good headland diving and stuff like that down there. A lot of rock, uh, rock sort of rocky reef and stuff like that. Um, good cave country. Lots of swell though, Dave. Um, yeah. <laughs> lots of uh, big, great white sharks occasionally that scare people. Um, talk to me about starting spearfishing. Would you say um, South Australia is a good place to start as a shore based spear, or um, how much, how how essential is a boat? Uh, I would I. I was primarily a, a shore based spearo for a very long time. So you certainly don't need a boat to experience some what I consider some some pretty pretty world class diving, really. Um, you know, obviously there's there's advantages to a boat. There's a lot of offshore islands and stuff like that off SA where you can get some pretty pretty specky fish and, and clear clearer water, but you certainly don't need it. There's like like you said, the the ponds the ponds down the southeast, Ewan's picking any and um and Killsby that I only did um Ewan's myself for the first time probably five years ago. And it it blew my mind. I was like, how have I been a diver in this state for as long as I've been and I've never experienced this? Yeah. And it's just absolutely beautiful. I'd re- highly recommend doing it the night at night as well. Book a book a time and do it at midnight and um you see see all the eels come out and oh, dive with a torch. So super spooky and yeah, but yeah. very safe. No, no white no white sharks in yeah. the ponds, so that's nice. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then and then you know down down that way, you certainly don't need a boat. It's it's as long as you get the swell down. We we usually sort of aim for sub one and a half meter swell um, with a with a fairly low period. And if you manage to jag that, then the cray diving down there is unbelievable. Mm. It's just yeah, it's some of my favorite favorite diving that you can that you can do is down there chasing the chasing the big bulls and you, know, you get them three. Three, four, even five kilos. Occasionally, I'm I'm yet to yet to crack the five kilo myself, but I'll I'll hopefully get there one day. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've cracked five either. Four point, maybe four point six in New Zealand or something like that. It was pretty, yeah. But any cray sort of that, even over three kilo, they you start to turn them around, hold them by their horns, and they can pull you through the water. You know, that's how powerful. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But our cray diving down there is great, and you definitely don't need a boat. It's there's there's so much so much limestone that's accessible from the shore there and you don't need any secret spots just just jump in and have a swim when the swell's low and you'll chances are you'll you'll find a cray and, and there's there's you know some some good spear fishing there as well like nice nice big sea sweep and snapper and mm. all of that big whiting uh, big squid come through those sorts of areas the gulf um, the same much the same or the gulfs i should say uh no nah, the gulfs are different they're probably a a fair bit more forgiving than down the down the southeast. There, the southeast is pretty exposed to the swell, whereas the gulfs um, can be a little bit harder to get. Uh, I guess uh, they're just they're just different. They're they're more more current affected, tidal affected, more so than the swell and wind. Obviously, onshore winds aren't ideal, but if you manage to get. But the good thing about the gulfs and the peninsulas. You know, you've got York Peninsula that splits Spencer Gulf and Gulf St Vincent. So the beautiful thing is having a having a north south facing peninsula there. Um, you generally, if you if you've got easterlies, then you dive the you know dive the opposite side to, to what you have if you've got the westerlies, and you can find that offshore wind. And if you get the offshore wind, usually you'll be able to find some clear enough water to have a dive. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, yeah. So starting out, maybe even in that Gulf area. Um, obviously it's a great idea if you do join the club and then you can probably go out on an open day or find someone at least to, to buddy along with. What are some of the species you start on and cut your teeth on there? Uh, pretty much there's all your southern species. Like you get your, you get your desirable southern species, so your flathead, your whiting, your snapper. Um, there's currently a ban on snapper at the moment, but, the, you know, they're sort of the, the – 
the, the top tier target species that you're sort of going for a lot of the time. You're not going for the bigger, you know, kingfish and tuna and that sort of stuff. But most spiros starting out in South Australia, they're going to start out shooting magpie perch, um, dusky morwong, you know, blue throat wrasse, like all these sort of scungy, demersal reef fish. Because you you jump in the water with a with a spear and you you're pretty you're pretty excited to have a have a crack and you just want to shoot something. And they're the sort of fish that you're going to chances are you're going to see first up when you jump in the water in South Australia. You're going to see those sorts of species. And so they're the they're the fish that get shot and. Uh, I don't have a huge issue with that. They're, they're, all those species are very common. Um, yes, they are demersal, but they're pretty well distributed throughout South Australia. Um, so a lot of a lot of people, you know, you see them get out of the water and they've got a dusky morwong, and they get given given grief about shooting a dusky morwong because it's a you know three kilo fish and it's the biggest fish they saw, but they're not highly regarded for their eating quality. But you can actually eat them. Like they actually, you know, the fish. A lot of these fish that the people cut their teeth on when they're first starting spearfishing, they're they're not. You know, no fish in South Australia are, are inedible. You can ah. you can one hundred percent prepare them. And most people, you know, silver drummer is another one. There's so many new new spearos, buff brim they call them over in Western Australia. But so many new spearos will go out and they'll be super stoked. They'll post up a photo of a, of a silver drummer they've shot. They'll just get given. They'll just get given grief, like absolutely ah. ripped apart on the on the socials. But then you know you, you read the comments and they'll go, oh, you know, I ate it and I thought it was okay, and I yeah. was I was pretty 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 happy with myself, you know. And I think that's I think that's great. <laughs> I am. Um, so. I introduced Tim McDonald was teaching my um, intermediate spearfishing course. Uh, here's one of the guys I had out. I introduced him to Shrek Viche. And I think his eyes were open to some of the more of the possibilities with with fish. And I think all of those species that you just named down there, the you know the perceived scungy fish, that yeah. there's a there's a way to cook all of them really well too. And like if it's your first fish you've ever shot and you shoot a silver drummer, it doesn't really matter how you cook it. You're going to enjoy eating that thing because there's just something about you just take it. Hundred percent. Yeah. Absolutely. And and further to that story, I, I, I do have a funny story on that one. Yeah. Um, I a few years ago we we're at a state titles on on Kangaroo Island. I I have a I have a little spot that I like to swim and and I shoot I usually shoot a dusky ball along and and burly along some sand lines for, for flathead. The flathead like to sort of sit in these sandy, weedy sort of patchy areas. And okay. I find if you shoot a dusky ball along and you swim through there and you, you you cut it up finely, only in shallow water, two three meters of water, they're not too stressed about about you know getting getting chomped or anything like that. And um, you, know, you burly these burly these sand lines, and you get these beautiful big flatheads come out and, and eat the eat the burly as it settles. And I was swimming through this area, and I'd, I'd shot a couple of um, couple of flathead, and, a, and I had a spare dusky morong that I hadn't got around to burly yet. I'm sitting on my float still, and I came in and came into the beach in front of the accommodation where all the other all the other spiros were staying, and and got out of the water, and and me getting out of the water with a dusky morong on my stringer, like they. They they gave me words. They had they had things to say about it, like oh, you know, <laughs> like Damo, what are you shooting at dusky for? I'm like, I just didn't get around to burling it, but it's fine. I'm going to eat it. It's all it's all good. I don't mind eating a dusky. And yeah, they're all turning their nose up at it. And anyway, the next day, um, a couple of these lads went out in their boat. I won't I won't name them, but <laughs> a couple of these lads went out in the boat and um, and they ended up sinking down the coast. So they 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 they, they sunk the boat, and it was a big big. Um, Big drama. They got it all on on video, which was a pretty funny watch later on. But um, they ended up sinking, ending up on the swimming the up like swimming the sunk boat into the rocks and and managed to to bail out and get a tow back to back to land. And I got a call. I was at a, I was at a winery with with my partner at a, at the time, and I got all these panic phone calls going. Oh, Dave, we've sunk the boat and blah 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 and. Anyway, they they wanted me to come and give them a hand because I, I was too far away. I didn't end up going there, but I said, "Look, when you when you get back, come back to my place. I'll, I'll you know let's have a little debrief and I'll cook you some dinner and yada yada yada." And anyway, they came back and they were all knackered and and uh, after the ordeal of the day, and and I cooked them this dusky morwong. <laughs> <laughs> so they had no idea what I cooked them. We were sitting there and they were eating it. And they they were eating it and going, oh yeah, this is this is really good. Thanks heaps. And I waited until they all finished before I told them they'd just eaten the dusky that they that they <laughs> gave, gave me shit for shooting the day before. But <laughs> but it's just an interesting interesting um you know a funny story about how how they didn't they didn't even know they were eating the scungy shit fish that you know that they had turned their noses up and made fun of you for. 
I think a lot exactly of- right. And they 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 defend themselves now, saying that they were they were exhausted and their and their taste buds weren't <laughs> working properly. But <laughs> you should have made them all shirts up the dusky lovers or something. <laughs> <laughs> the Mo yeah. Bros, the Mo Bros or something. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, buddy, how's your breath hold going? Really? You struggling? I do too sometimes, and that's why I've got something perfect for you today. I think you'll agree with me when I say that maintaining or even increasing your breath hold is a struggle, especially when you're not slaying fish every week. But what if I told you there was a way to train yourself easily and do it safely? Freediving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold understand your body better and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program, Freediving for Spearfishers, is not for noobs. Uh, It's for people who have some diving under their belts and understand basic spearfishing safety. But it's perfect for spearos who want a guided, easy to follow and complete program with videos, a clear process and a set goal. The goal is a five minute static. And check it out, Freediving for Spearfishers at howtofreedive.com. You can get started for free, do the taster, and if you do decide to purchase, use the code NOOBSPERO, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O, to save some money if you do decide to purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution, bar none, for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer if you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough. Just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar, it's less acidic than other options on the market, it's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just 1% to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to 6 or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored for Spiros and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. Hey Nooba, get your froth on with some Noob Spiro gear. The Jobfish Tribute, Spiro Dad, Rancid Pelican. This gear is only available at noobspiro.com. From flip-flops, crocs and socks, through to hats, shirts and stickers. Get your froth on with Noob Spiro at noobspiro.com. Kangaroo Island seems pretty cool. Like I see those Harlequin, um, what are they, Harlequin, Harlequin, what are they called again? Harlequin... Yeah, the harlequin fish. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they're amazing looking fish too. Are they they're pretty. Um, are they pretty rare these days? Are they easily sort of targeted? Or I would the the con- conservation groups in South Australia will try to convince you that they're rare. Yeah. Um, I don't think they're anywhere near as rare as they're perceived to be. I think there's a lot more of them out there than. Than what a lot of the, a lot of the conservation groups they'll dive areas on scuba, they're very noisy. They actually don't you know they they don't have a whole lot of fish sense yeah. and actual <laughs> ability of knowing how to find a fish. They're more used to you know, taking a photo of a bit of coral on a jetty pile on than actually finding a fish species under a yeah. rock. But so when I go spear fishing areas where you'll find harlequin, I'll see heaps of harlequin. Mm. But you go with somebody who doesn't actually know how to look for them. And they'll struggle to find them. Hence, they get labelled a rare species. Mm. Um, they are very demersal, and they are absolutely gorgeous, iconic South Australian fish. So, for a long time, this is where again the mentorship of Mary Ann Stacey, um, you know, back when I first started spear fishing, rubs through to to me now mentoring other divers. When I went on Mary Ann's boat um, diving areas like Kangaroo Island, where you would get harlequin fish when I was when I was a young spiro. She would say, "Shoot one. If you see one and you want one, shoot one, and that's it. I don't want. I don't want you coming on board the boat with two or three of these beautiful, yeah. demersal, iconic fish." And 
Spiro is a fantastic for that. They self-regulate. There was there was no bag limit on them for a long time. There is there is now, um, which I think is a really good thing. Um, but yeah, they're they're a gorgeous fish, and I I don't shoot a lot of them these days just because I think they're they're too pretty to look at. Yeah, um, yeah. But you don't begrudge others and, having shooting one. And, Absolutely not. If you come out on my boat, I'll, I'll more than happily just let you let you shoot a harlequin fish, but don't shoot two or three. Yep, I think that I, I like what you just said there too. Self regulating, like particularly spiros as they develop a bit of maturity. Like, and if they're around the right people and they're part of a good club culture where you have people like Mary and Stacy, like that's a that's a mentor of the highest caliber. Like teaching you, like and and showing you, like yeah. You can appreciate it, but hey, how about just one one each? I think I think some species are vulnerable to spearfishing, and I think when we have these self imposed regulations, we don't need to rely on the government, which unfortunately they seem to be either one way or the other. They're either it's like too open and too unregulated, or the size the minimum sizes are ridiculous, etc. We as we all know, or they go the other way and they go, oh no, let's just lock it down for. 12 months or, you know, whatever they're doing at the moment in some places. It's, it doesn't need to be this such a strong response if we just manage ourselves and our efforts a little bit better. I, th- I, th- I think that's a cool example of it. Absolutely. It, it, it's, and Spiros are, Spiros are fantastic for it. They've, you know, the, the people that I dive with, you, you, know, you very rarely see a, a decent, experienced Spiro doing something where you go, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit rough. Like we, we only ever take what, you know, you, when you get, when you talk about, I'm not, I don't want to rag on line fishing or anything like that, but it, it is fairly indiscriminatory. When you're fishing 40, 50 meters of water and you're catching a fish, you know, it, you've got, you've got no control over whether that fish suffers barrow trauma and ends up yeah. dying. And regardless of whether, whether it's protected or not, you know, you, you, you're killing that fish, even though you're throwing it back in the water. Whereas spear fishing, you've got the ability to just be able to go, I'm going to take one of these fish and that's all I'm going to take or, yeah. you know, and I, I, that's that's what I love about the about the sport and about spear fishing as a as a sustainable fishing method. Guys, if you want to have a look at a harlequin fish, you live in a different part of the world. Um, come to today's show notes. It'll be Noob Spiro forward slash Dave D A V E, and then I'll link up um, you know anything we chat about today. But I'd lo- I'd love to show you what a harlequin fish looks like. Because have you got a good one of you with one Dave? Would you would I would you mind if I use that in the show notes? Yeah, sure. I'll be able to find your photo. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be no cool. I know it might not be like the best image because it's like you, you don't want to inadvertently <laughs> like promote, hey, like this is a South Australian trophy, but I just think it's an incredibly iconic species down your way. Yeah, they, they really are. And I'd, I'd, you know, if people want to come over and, and if you do, if you do go diving in an area where you see harlequin fish, please just, just self regulate. They're, they're, they're not rare, but they are um, a sensitive topic for, for the conservation guys in, in South Australia. So, Please don't go out and shoot a stringer full of them. Just just take one, get a good photo of it. They're they're gorgeous fish and they're really good to eat. Um, but yeah, do the right thing. Um, who's got the state record on it? Oh, good question. I don't know. I read they grow up about, over six kilo or something. Yeah, probably six kilo might be one shot in Western Australia, maybe. But I think our state records around the four kilo mark. Okay. Um, Definitely beatable. There's there's definitely some some real big ones. I've I've come close a couple of times, but haven't quite managed to nudge it. But I've heard heard of guys seeing some real big ones. Um, yeah. Um, I see you're wearing a Torelli shirt. Uh, any association there with the with Rob? Uh, a fr- pretty friendly rivalry with with, <laughs> with Rob. Um, <laughs> but uh, Rob Rob um, yeah Rob actually doesn't doesn't own Torelli. Torelli's owned by a, by um, Paul and Margie Dorfstatter over in over in Victoria. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they're they're um, just a good good Australian owned family business that produce some some top quality gear. I've I've been I've been using their gear for a really long time now, and yeah, absolutely love it. Love love everything they bring out. Sweet. Oh, that's cool. I didn't even realise that. It shows you how out of the loop I am with that. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's really. Torelli Spearfishing or torellyaustralia.com.au, something like that. They, they run pretty much mostly online these days. But they're um, if you're coming down doing some cray diving in, in South Australia, they're Kevlar. Um, I think they're three mil Kevlar cray gloves that they they sell are absolutely top notch on the southerns. They they really find that find that line between being tough enough to to not absolutely ruin your hands on the southerns big fighting claws. They they always try to rip into you with, but they're 
sensitive enough to still be able to feel what you're doing when you're cray diving, which is a pretty pretty hard balance to. Oh, 100% to it is. I was going to say that. So many gloves yeah. you buy are just like they either fall apart in two dives, or they um, or you've got just nothing, no no sensitivity at all, and you just you hate that restrictiveness and that lack of ability to sort of feel around and stuff. So that's pretty cool. Which you definitely need when you when you cray diving. You have to have that dexterity in your fingers to be able to do it properly. Mm. Um, but you, you know, if you if you wear thin gloves where you can feel everything you're doing, you, you come come home looking like you've been in a in a war with a cat in a cage. You know. Yeah, yeah. I remember like in New Zealand when I was actually scuba diving, getting them on scuba. Um, the Southerns. Um, this is way back in the day. We'd be out on reefs that were current affected, twenty to twenty five meters, and be getting these big southerns and I remember learning how to do the forwards and backs you know how they they sprawl in yeah. the cave and you, you it's counterintuitive to actually push the cray into the hole but like uh it, it all of a sudden it, when you connect that and you realize what they're doing what their behavior is when you do grab one of their horns it's like that was pretty cool yeah yeah they they love they love to lock themselves in and the, yeah. the direction that all of their all the spines on the carapace are facing you that you're not not going to always be able to just, just with brute strength, pull them straight out the way you want them to yeah. come. You got to, got to sort of dislodge them a little bit by pushing them back in, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, and you lose half their legs as well, and all the rest of it. It's just like, and like if it, <laughs> if it's soft or if it's in berry, which you can't often tell until you pull it out. Um, then, then yeah. you're like, you feel like a piece of shit breaking their legs off, and or breaking yeah, their definitely. feelers off. All of it. It's just yeah, but yeah, yeah. There's an art. There's such an art to learning how to how to get southerns. Yeah, I think I think southerns are. I've, I have caught you know most crays around around Australia, and I I rate the southerns right up there. Either I've probably caught more southerns than than any of the other ones, obviously. But I I still just love chasing them. They're always a challenge. They'll you know, you you'll see a southern in a ledge, and it'll be looking at you one way, and you go right. This is a because we'll 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 snare them by the horn, or we'll snare them by the tail, or we'll grab them with our hands. In South Australia, you're allowed to use use a cray snare. Um, so there's sort of three three ways that you can go about it, and every cray will will be a little bit different which which direction you sort of come in on it at. And quite often you go, oh, this is a this is a hands down tail snare job, or just go in. He's nice and open behind. You breathe up on the surface, and you go down there, and he's turned just a little bit and backed his tail up against the corner. So you have got to be thinking on your toes all the time and go, all oh, right, like now I'll go for the horn, or actually he's backed himself into a corner where I don't even need the snare at all. I'll just just grab him with my hands and. Yeah, you know the amount of times that you that a real good cray has been in a in a in a hole with two entrances, and you sort of you du- double teaming a cray with your mate, where you, you know, he's he's diving on one side and shining the torch, which is sort of spooking the cray back towards you, and ah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, those, those sorts of those sorts of crays where you work on them for 10, 15 minutes with with your mate, and you and you you know one up, one down, and and sort of you know pushing in the direction you want it to go, and eventually you get it out. It's it's, it's fun. Good, just good fun, 100%. real good fun. They eat so well too. Like, oh, yeah, really one of the best yeah. eating crays out there. I, yeah. got, I have James Sacker. He 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 argues he's he's dead set that Easterns are better. But I um, <laughs> I I I grew up on Southerns. It's hard to go past them. Like, yeah, and they they're so funky to catch. And they. Like you say, they rip you. They rip you apart, and their hooks too. If their hooks get into you, they can actually do some proper damage. The big ones. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, they've got those. They've got those little spikes in the in the front fighting claws. If you if you get your get your hand in between the the spike and the actual the actual fighting claw leg itself, it'll put the spike right through your hand. Like yeah. you gotta be gotta be pretty careful. I see guys like stuffing them down the, their wetsuits, and I was like, I would never <laughs> ever do that with crazy New Zealand. Like not not ever. I'd, I'd want to be getting my wetsuits for free if I was doing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you ever use the trick where you put a bit of weed in front of your hand, like, like, um, and then you you sort of sneak in and their feelers go out, and then um, you sort of sneak in a little bit further, and then their feelers come in and they'll sort of feel it, and then they go, oh, it's no threat, and then they go out, and you just keep sneaking in a bit. I, I've I've never done that. No. All right. I can see how it would work, though. Yeah, I've seen some dirty tricks. Sam Wild had some cool footage back in the day, too. Are you, are you familiar with him? Yeah, I am. Yeah, with the Fiordland one. Did you see that with the any um, covered his glove and sort of um, like fish and stuff like that? And that way, the cray was kind of fully feeling him out and stuff. I thought that was free. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I do. I do burly, burly for craze. Like I'll quite often dive with a drop weight with a with a sea sweep on it, or or just a common fish that you find around the around the cray areas, and and you you use that drop bait out the front of the cave to sort of lure them out if they're a little bit little bit too deep in. Oh, okay. Um, that that quite often quite often works a treat if you um if you, if you yeah if there's one that's just just out of reach in a in a deep cave they will respond to burly quite well yeah. What's your um bag and size limits there now for them? Uh, so you're allowed four four per person per day, um eight per boat. So yeah, usually shore diving's the way to go it, and then you can then you can just get your four and um. Yeah, and size limit, there's two different size limits. So down the southeast where we were talking about before, um, it's really swelly but really limestoney and quite quite a good cray fishery. Um, size limit's 9.85 centimetres carapace length. And then in the northern zone, so the peninsulas, the gulfs, um, all those sorts of areas, pretty much anywhere else in the state, um, it's 10.5 centimetre carapace length, but the bag limit stays the same for four per person per day. Some some people might hear four per person per day, and they think cheapest. That's a lot of lobster. But when you when you count on inclement weather, um, do you have a closed season there as well, or is it? We don't have a we well, we do yeah. So from um, from May until October, October November, the two zones open at different times. One opens in October, the other opens in November, but they they do close down from from May until October each year through the winter months. So you've got inclement weather and you've got a closed season, and so that's the bag limit actually probably sounds appropriate. How are you feeling that fishery is faring? Is it is it well managed? Is it are we doing all right? Anecdotally, I think yeah, I think it's I think it's okay, especially the um, especially the southern zone. I think the southern zone is quite a healthy fishery. Limestone limestone is just a honeycomb of poles that that, that you know the craze. You're only seeing. You know, a quarter of the craze that are actually there because they're they're down in down in the stories of limestone, you know. Yeah. So, and it's it. it I think the fishery over there is is very sustainable, um, especially when you take into account the inclement weather. You can only dive at it. You know, nine nine weekends out of ten is just a complete wipeout. There's no way you could dive yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it you know it does get potted during during the more rougher times. Um, we're allowed a recreational pot over here as well. Um, but I think over there the, the fishery is quite sustainable. Um, elsewhere in the state, uh, I probably wouldn't be opposed to a to a slightly lesser bag limit yeah. um, in in the in the northern zone. Um, for for craze is a lot when you when you think about the the other areas of the state. So yeah, but over overall, I think it's okay. I'm not not too concerned yeah, yeah. about. It's just sometimes a good conversation to have. I feel like, you know, a lot of Spiros dislike the idea of us volunteering to put regulations on ourselves and stuff. But, like, there's a certain, I don't know, there's a certain level of, like, you know, awareness that we have, I think, and then, and it's and it's good to be honest about it because then we're part of proactive stuff rather than um, on the back end of something more forceful and ugly that we actually don't want. I mean, I've never talked to a sparrow that's gone, oh, jeepers, I hope we wipe the fishery out and there's nothing there for my children. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, it's so, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a good combo to have. 100%, yeah. I want to talk with you about a couple of things. I want to talk to you about commercial ab diving, commercial diving in general. Um, is it something that you enjoyed? I'm, uh, you're not doing it anymore? Um, I've heard it's bloody hard yakka. Yeah, yeah, it it, it is. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the ab diving I'm not not doing at the moment. Um, the industry it's a pretty pretty cutthroat, tough industry to be in. Um, and yeah, it, it, I've, I've been taken off my licenses unfortunately at the moment, but hopefully oh. can can get myself back in there. Um, but it is tough, but it is. I, I absolutely loved eighty percent of the days that I worked. Yeah, <laughs> you you always get those always get those days where it's cold and dirty, and you're diving, you're forced to dive somewhere you don't really want to dive, and um, you know those days are those days are challenging. But um, you know, for the for the couple of them that you get, it's um, a lot of days you're diving beautiful clear water and looking at looking at fish, and you're just swimming around. Chipping some chipping some snails, going. I can't believe I'm getting paid for this, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's um, yeah, it's it's a it's a great job and and 
pretty pretty rewarding. I, I've got no regrets about the time that I've spent doing it. What's the setup for that? Is it hooker? How many divers in the water? What's your sort of setup and how does the licensing and stuff work? Yeah, so it's, it's a little bit different depending on where you go. So I've, I've, I've dived and deckied in Western Australia and I've deckied in South Australia and dived and deckied in Victoria. So I've sort of done most of Southern Australia and it's a little bit different depending on the state. So in Western Australia, we, it, was, it was a bit deeper water. Um, but you were allowed to have two divers in the water each day. So we would, we would dive, um, dive and decky taken in turns throughout the day. So we'd dive for a couple of hours until we'd, we'd used up our bottom time. And then we'd come out, swap out with the decky on the top. You'd dive for a couple of hours. So you do, do a couple of dives each a day like that. Um, whereas South Australia, you're only allowed one diver per day. But you can take, you can do alternate days. So you could dive one diver one day, another diver the next day and take it in turns like that, which is a, which is a good thing to, to, um, safety wise. So you're not building up your nitrogen with, um, with multiple days diving in a row, um, which is definitely something that can become an issue. Yep. Um, but then in Victoria, uh, it's, it's usually just the one diver. But you can dive to two different divers on different licenses off the one boat, which is really good fun. Some of the most fun days that I've that I've had is when you when you're diving. I did a, did a few days on on the T piece with um with Murray Peterson over there in Victoria, and and you just have a you just have an absolute absolute laugh, you know, like when you when you're on the bottom with with one of your best mates, and you know you're working, but you're always you're always bantering with each other. The last the last dive of the season that I did over there last year, um. You know, Murray only had a had a fairly small amount of abs to catch, and and I, I had I had nearly a nearly a ton to left to come off my license, and um and we hit this area that was just absolutely plastered. Neither of us had dived it before, and but it was just loaded with abs, and we were just we were just having an absolute hoot, and um yeah, you know, Murray was giving me giving me grief on the bottom because he was filling. He's a, he's an exceptional diver. He was filling his bags a fair bit quicker than I was managing to fill mine. So I was, I was uh, once we'd sort of worked out the day was going really well and, and we were gonna we were gonna you know both both of us were gonna finish off our quota the, the stuff we were doing on the bottom you know like I was I was swimming along behind him taking abs out of his bag and putting them in my bag to sort of keep keep his numbers down a little bit and he, he'd be behind me he was trying to put rocks in my bag and you know <laughs> yeah, that's stuff cool. like that it's just just you know you're looking around in, in beautiful clear water there's abs everywhere and you just go yeah you know, that that's one of those days where you just go how how good is this it's just yeah. we're, we're living the dream right now you and I were talking before we jumped on here earlier and I was saying like uh, we were talking about comp diving and I was telling you about my pathetic amount of you know experience doing it but I think I'm going to see you in the nationals next year over in WA and um I made an observation that I reckon if you want to be ser- a serious comp diver you want to spend 100 200 days a year in the water and you were sort of agreeing with that and um but you you're 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 a proper comp diver. Like you've been serious before and you've had a couple of good cracks to talk us through comp diving for you and um, where it is now, but maybe take us back to when, you, when you started doing it and, and what, what, what's the appeal? Yeah. Um, I can, I can talk about comps for hours with you, Shrek. Yeah, um, do it, let's do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it started, I've always been very competitive, even from a very young age I've, always wanted to be the best at something like I, I, when I was young it didn't matter what it was but I, I wanted to be the best at something and um, and as it turns out spearfishing is the direction that I went and I, I don't unfortunately I don't think that I'm the best at spearfishing <laughs> <laughs> Mate, but, I've, but I've had a to be fair like gee was like we've like we've got some amazing human beings in it like it's it's and it's such a crazy thing too, isn't it? To be competitive at, like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It is pretty unique and niche. But you know, so once I once I decided that that was that was what I was going to do, I was going to focus on the focus on the spear fishing and and Mary Ann and Sam Dawson, who I who I first started diving pretty seriously with, um, yeah, they were they were both reasonably competitively minded as well, um, and my first comp was two thousand and. Eight, I travelled over to to Shell Harbour to compete in the 2008 Nationals over there in New South Wales, um, and did absolutely terribly. It was it was the first 
I think my, my very first day I shot one fish. Um, second day, I think I did a little bit better, got, got three or four, maybe five fish, something like that. But my fins at the time were too, were too tight and small on my feet for me. So I was, I was developing a really, really sore foot. And by the end of the second day, I could barely swim. And come the third day, like I'm not, I don't give up very easily. And, but I was in halfway through the third day, I was in that much pain that I literally couldn't swim. I, I got out of the water and was just, I was pretty dirty on myself because I'm, I am competitive. I knew I'd done really badly. And, um, and, <laughs> Interestingly, at the at the presentation of that competition, I uh, I vividly remember sitting there, and a, and a very well known Australian spearfisher spoke to me, and and he 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 asked about the third day and why I got out early, and, and I, I said, oh, you know, I got, you know, got got a sore foot and this and that, and he told me that I was pathetic and I would never amount to anything. What the fuck? <laughs> that is fucking brutal. Yeah, it was very brutal. And as a as a young a young Spiro getting told that by somebody who who um you know is quite well regarded in the in the spearfishing scene, I was like, radio, like and it, it hurt, it definitely hurt, but I would like I would like to think that um it, it fired me up a little bit. Yeah. And uh and then at my next competition that I did was two thousand and apart from our local South Australian comp, the next one that I did was uh, 2010 in in Rye in Victoria on the Mornington Peninsula. Yep, yep. And um, you know, competing against a lot of the the best divers in Southern Australia at the time. You know, the Murray Petersons, Drew Fanny, Rob Torelli, um, all of those sorts of guys went out on the first day. Didn't really know. Me and Sam did spend a reasonable amount of time scouting before that comp, but didn't really know the area. Didn't really know you know a whole lot of what what I was doing in that in that area and ended up going out and, and winning the day on the first day of the nationals so ah, beautiful. and that so the, the turnaround that you need a moment when you're competitively spearfishing you need a moment where you go from being just just a diver having a crack and and you know whether it's having fun or whether you're taking it seriously but you know there needs to be a moment where you actually believe that you can do it and to yeah. me winning that first day of that nationals in 2010 that was the moment that the penny dropped and I went, oh, right, okay, I, I can do this. Like, yeah. Admittedly, on that day, those top divers, for some reason, none of them managed to find the fish and, and I did. I think 10 fish on – I think I shot 10 fish for the day. Oh, that's hectic and in, in that area. 10 fish in that ten fish in that area probably shouldn't have been enough on that day to, to win the day. Mm. Um, I think a lot of the other top divers got a little bit unlucky. and, and um, that's, one, that's, yeah. that's 10 different species or is that – yeah, correct. Yeah, that's bloody awesome. That's bloody yeah. awesome. Yeah. So I didn't. I didn't end up to go on. Go on and win. I, I won intermediate. I won my age category for for that competition. But the next the next couple of days, I didn't didn't do as well as I did on the first day. But um, still competitive. But I did shoot a. I shot a shot a twelve and a half kilo kingfish untethered on my pranger gun on the on the third day off off YCW near um, it was on Phillip Island there. Um, so overall, the comp, the comp to me, you know, shooting shooting that fish at the end of the third day, that that comp was the competition that that filled me with the belief that I actually did have what it took to to compete at the level that I wanted to compete at. Bloody and, awesome! And that that confidence and that that belief, it, I think it happens to a lot of a lot of spearos in the competition scene. There is a moment that you go from being just a just a diver having a crack, and you're just a one of the field, to actually knowing that you can. Can you can it. do it. That's a good thing about, I guess, the, like the little social comps as well. Like, um, even if you beat like four or five people that show up on the day, like it does give you a little bit of a like. Well, I'm not. I'm not the worst. <laughs> I'm not the worst yeah. in the whole world. <laughs> I'm just, you know, like. But yeah, that's cool, man. So what that that bloke that gave you those awful that awful bit of discouragement? Did you end up beating him in that cop? Was he there? Uh, he. I think he was there in uh, in two thousand and ten. I yep. hope he yep. ate his words and he thought to himself, <laughs> "I might have just fired this." This to be honest out. with you, when he said it to me, he was probably quite pissed, and he probably uh, wouldn't even remember that that was what he said. But um, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, okay. It, I've I've certainly never forgotten it. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that would suck, man. Because like you know, you have a difficult thing, like you say, like you 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 know, your foot plays up the whole comp. You you have a bad day, then. 
you know, and then you, you eventually kind of give up because you succumb to injury. And then you get that yeah. at the end of it, like far out. That is, uh, that's for enough people, for, for a lot of people, that's enough to put them off doing something forever. You know, like, so good on you for having the resilience and the sheer sort of doggedness to <laughs> have another frigging crack on the big, yeah. on the big stage too, I might add. And then, uh, yeah. you, you probably got your reward in that thing. That's probably what, why it meant so much on day one. That's cool. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 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 So nowadays, like you're a family man, you got, you got kids and, um, I know one of your kids is getting into it, um, or, or is seriously into it, I should say. And then, um, and obviously the older you get, the busier you get too. It's hard to stay competitive, isn't it? It is. Um, the, the conflict that I've found recently is, um, my daughter Dakota, she, she loves diving with me. So every competition She's like, oh, you, what, what, what's going on here? Are you, are you diving with me or are you diving for yourself? And, and as a dad, you're, you're very torn. Like yeah. you, you do want to, like I want, I want to dive with her all the time, but yeah. at the same time I'm not ready to give up my own, <laughs> my own competitive career yeah, either. Yeah, yeah. So I, get it. It, I, I would like to think that I find a little bit of a balance and it, and it gives me a, an easy excuse if I'm, um, if I'm not, not really feeling like, you know, going – Going all in in a comp, I can still I can still dive the comp and and have a good time and swim with her swim with her and um yeah and, and it's it's pretty it's pretty rewarding when you see you know kids learn so quickly and she's she's taken to it like like a duck to water um you know go from and that doesn't feel like that long ago that you know she was she was shooting her first fish which was again a mag a magpie perch and a and a um and a sea carp in the ponds in, in Port Ferry, you know, magpie perch are okay eating, but the sea carp certainly aren't, but we still ate it. And, you know, it, she goes from, she goes from shooting them to, you know, earlier on this year, um, diving the Eden, we, we rock hopped the Eden comp together. And, um, and like watching, watching your 13 year old daughter diving, you know, seven, eight, nine meters laying on the bottom and, and shooting some actually quite, good fish you go you know shit that that's pretty that's how, pretty awesome how old is she 13 that's bloody impressive like obviously she's yeah had, she's had you around but that's that's friggin props to her like um yeah well on on, on, that, on that particular day she, she I, I had my game plan was like i'm not i'm not taking the rock hop particularly seriously but once she ticks off a species that that opens up that species for me unless it's a really tricky so if i'm laying on the bottom and i get a I get a tailor come in real flying in the wash. Like, obviously, she's not going to shoot that, so I'll shoot it first. But as far as the basic species, you go over there, you know, your red moeys and your banded moeys and your, you know. Bastard um, trumpeter, goatfish. Yeah, your, your luderick and, and all of that sort of stuff. I thought, you know, I'll let her have, have first cracks at them. Once she's got them on the float, then then I'll I'll go for them. And, um, and on this day, she was, she, we, were doing, we were doing okay. We had each had, you know, half a dozen fish each, but. And she had a half decent sized band of Molong, but I I knew the area would dive and there was gonna be some real, real big ones down, probably in the depths that, that she wasn't gonna be able to get to. And it was dropping off quite quick. So she was she was about ten meters away from me in the in the slightly in the shallows, sort of working on some fish up there, and I was doing a few deeper drops off the off the edge while still keeping an eye on her. <laughs> and um and you know, I came I came up after a dive and it was quite surgy and washy and Came up after a dive, just going like I couldn't get my hands on a on a on a good band of wall. And I was just going, what is going on here? Like there's got to be a big one here somewhere. And she she came she came swimming over to me through the through the wash. She just she just had this bloody horse of a banded. And I, I just shook my head, just going, I cannot believe that I've spent the last 10, 15 minutes looking for a looking for a band of wall. She already had one. She didn't need another one. <laughs> Yeah, so she, <laughs> but she just did the old, did the old upgrade. upsize and yep. shot the fish that I'd been looking for. But yeah, yeah, nice. That's cool. So yeah. I mean, getting your kids into spearfishing can be a bit awkward. Like, not all of them want to do it. Not all of them take to it. I think spearfishing, out of any sort of thing you could do, has a a really high attrition rate. Would you agree with that? Mm. Uh, you got to you got to avoid using long words with me. Um, Shrek, I'm, I'm just a I'm just a dumb ab diver, oh, so you're gonna yeah. have to explain to me what attrition means. You know, like let's just say, like ten people start, I would say eight people do not continue. You know, 
And um, yeah. out, out of those two that continue, one might be like, you know, your part timer that get jumps in the water every year or two, and then the other person just absolutely froths and becomes obsessed. But like eight, eight out of those ten people, sometimes will never come jump back in the water again. Well, I'd imagine the percentage is still high, even if you've got family or you know, like a dad that does it, and they instill that love of it with you. But it's still like a bit delicate, you know. Like I've taken my kids spearfishing, and they've kind of hum and ha about it, and um, their grandmother scares them with stories of sharks. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and yeah. It's, it's it's hard to sometimes overcome those those mental barriers. I mean, talk to me about. Um, how, how did you get, you know, your 13-year-old diving at nine metres and shooting better fish than you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I started off, started off, you, you've just got to keep it, keep it really fun. Don't, don't chuck your kid in the water in the middle of winter when it's filthy dirty and it's swelly and there's going to be waves crashing over their snorkel and all that sort of stuff. Like I, I, I spent time with her in the pool first, first and foremost where it's, Clear, warm, just getting her used to the the mask, how it fits. Because even just just putting a mask on your eyes, where it's covering your nose, and then you got to put this thing in your mouth and breathe through the snorkel. That that's hugely challenging in itself for a kid to get their head around that you can't actually breathe in your nose. Mm. You're only breathing in your mouth. Mm. So I think if you if you've got a young kid and you're wanting to get them into it, start in the pool. Just put them in a pool with a, with a snorkel and, and a mask, and once they once they can swim around on the surface, head down, they'll they'll absolutely love it. And and then get them get them duck diving, get them putting their head under, clearing the snorkel, teach them all those basics in a really controlled environment. That's what I did with Dakota. And as soon as she was good with that, the first dive that I did with her was um, at an area in South Australia where it's it's quite protected quite calm there's a fringing reef there but it's fishy so it's a marine reserve there's no spear fishing there was no spear guns involved so and on a beautiful clear day in the middle of summer you put them in there there's no way you can't enjoy that yeah. like I, I still enjoy going for a swim there and yeah you, know, you start start with those basics and all those all that stuff you'll just plant the seed and then and then they're comfortable in the water they're not cold they're seeing lots of fish there's not waves crashing over their snorkel you know, it's all building good experiences and it, eventually it gets to the point and the whole time, like Dakota, the whole time she was going, when, when can I, when can I use a gun? When can I use a gun? You know, she's, she's always after the next step, you know? Yeah. Um, and eventually it got to that point where it's like, yeah, you're, you're diving, you're hitting, you're hitting the bottom in seven meters of water here, you're coming up, clearing your snorkel properly. Yeah. You're ready. Like, let's go, let's go for a spear. And, you know, and then, Kids learn really quickly. So you, you, when you when you when she goes out with a gun for the first time, it's just like shooting from the hip, just yeah. you know, wild shots, miss, missing the fish by a meter, and just going, "Hang on, that's slow down, slow down." And it, and it's been like that. Like she'll she'll when you first start diving, first couple of shots are just wild. She's just too excited, and and you know, you're watching from the surface, and it's just like Dakota. You literally missed that fish by about three feet. Uh, that wasn't even that wasn't even remotely in the ballpark. Like, yeah, t- yeah. turn your brain on, slow down. Like, yeah, look at yeah. where you're aiming, and and you know, I think just just starting with the basics is the most important thing you can possibly do, and the rest the rest will come automatically if you do it if you do it right. What size shirt are you, Dave? Uh, medium. Medium. All right. I'm gonna send you. Fella. I'm gonna send you a Spiro Dad shirt after the podcast, mate. You've been the. You, that's been the best strategic answer I've had to taking it, taking a kid in a very sort of clear, methodical manner. Like, I really like your idea. Like, teaching the the skills in a controlled environment, like the swimming pool, and then picking your day when you get them out, taking them to a place that's rich in marine life. These things sound like. It just sounds like a really careful and clever approach like you've sort of done everything to set her up for success in spearfishing i think which is probably why she's doing what she is now traveling with you interstate to compete which is pretty freaking yeah. cool man yeah Ab- absolutely i i absolutely love it and and she you know early, i think it was earlier earlier this year i was working um i had to work on the ab boat in, in january when when one of our one of our favorite comps the western districts comp over in victoria was on and um, and she was so keen to go, and so devastated that that she couldn't because I wasn't going. And yeah. and you know, 
her mum was like, well, just because just because Dave's not going doesn't mean we can't go. And she ended up going over there and, and diving with with um, Paul Dorsat, the owner of Torelli. Yeah. Paul offered to, to take her out diving, which, again, that that's the next step when you, you start, you know, when, when they get good enough that you're comfortable with them going with somebody else who you trust. Yeah. And that's been hugely um, beneficial for her because there's there's things that, that I can teach her. Like I'm teaching her my way. I'm teaching her how I do things. But yeah. – I don't know everything and there's yeah. things that Paul like she came home and she was telling me all this stuff and she shot some really good fish she shot some shot some snapper which are incredibly hard fish to shoot over there in Victoria wow. um and I think I think it was actually a, a Victorian um junior record snapper that she shot during that oh. competition <laughs> and um you know like but the her going over there and actually showing the, showing the initiative and doing it without me being there showed that she actually does love it. She wants to do it regardless of whether I do it or not. And the, and the things that Paul would have taught her in the water, like I don't know everything. Yeah. There's things that he, she would have learned from him that she wasn't going to ever learn from me. Mm. Um, so I think that's 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 another really good thing. If you if your kids do get right into it, encourage them to dive with other people that aren't just you. Yeah. But certainly in the early days, keep it fun. It, as soon as they're getting cold, get them out of the water. As soon as they, if the conditions aren't right, don't don't push them, don't force them to do anything they don't want to do. Um, you know, once once they're experienced, once they're at Dakota, like where Dakota is now, I would push her now, and I certainly do. Like there's there's um, you know, there was some pretty pretty big swells and like waves crashing against the rocks when we were diving in the in the Eden Comp earlier on in the year, and but she was she's at the level now where, you know. I'm not going to let her pussy out of a, a tough situation. She is good enough to be able to handle it, and it's just like look up every now, and look at, look up every now and then, look at where the waves coming from, read the waves. It's not going to not going to smash you on the rocks. You are in a safe position, but just watch where where it is breaking, and don't go in there. Like just you know, read the read the swell, read the weather, do the right thing, and and you know there is a time when you do flick that switch and start pushing them a little bit harder. Yeah. Um, but early on, keep it fun, mate. So many, so many wisdom drops in there. Like one thing I got out of it too, like is part of it's just being a good dad. Like um, being a dad is a lot of work, and putting yourself second. Like you're doing it now, even with comps. Sometimes, by the sounds of it, I think. Um, but that's kind of what our job is as dads: is to put your own stuff to the side for a sec, so that you can create and help them become awesome human beings so that's pretty cool man hats off to you that's i've got to send you a shirt <laughs> thank, thank, thanks a lot mate I, that's that's very kind words i appreciate that i'm looking forward <laughs> to seeing her uh i guess take out the australian woman so i'm, I'm betting she uh, the, the trajectory she's on it, um it'll be cool to see her there in a few years she she certainly um certainly wants it and if she keeps it up she's she's got the got the ability yeah. she's just got to just got to keep that, like you said. Just got to keep that focus. And some, it's not going to be the. You know, she's only thirteen. Like she's gonna, she's gonna start meeting boys and doing all that sort of wild shit that I don't really want to talk about. But um, <laughs> you know, that's gonna, <laughs> that's gonna, that's gonna, that sort of stuff's gonna take a priority over her life at some point over spearfishing. But hopefully, the, what 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 we've done in these years has instilled some sort of some sort of love for it that mm. she'll keep it up to some capacity, whether it's competitive or just putting a, a feed of fish on the table. Mm. Swear that Spiro dad shirt with a shotgun and, and uh, greet every boy <laughs> at the front door with that. <laughs> I'll, I'll need to be warning them against her, I reckon. I don't think they need to worry too much about me. She, she'll, she'll, be a bloody ha- she'll be a bloody handful. <laughs> uh, yeah, good stuff. Ah, equalising. One of those things that you take for granted most days when everything's working perfectly. But what if it's not? Maybe that's your biggest struggle. Are you equalising correctly? Learn how to get your EQ game tight with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. Check out Ted's equalising course at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted and Master Frenzel, troubleshoot your EQ game and keep charging in your spearing game. Learn more at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted and use the code noobspiro to save some dosh. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform 
with Kill Shot Spear Guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Luba. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, Crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. Did you know when coming up from a spearfishing dive, it's possible that you would feel 100% fine right until the moment you blacked out? Did you know being dehydrated or hungover increases your risk of having a blackout? Did you know I have never seen a person hit the surface and yell, Tad, help, I'm about to black out, come save me. No, they typically hit the surface, take a couple of breaths, and then quietly sink into the abyss. Whether they live or die is 100% dependent on if you are close enough to grab them and take care of the situation. Did you know it's very easy to have a loss of motor control or a minor blackout and not even know that you had one? Did you know that if you have a loss of motor control or blackout and you continue diving that day, you are way more likely to have a much worse blackout? Did you know breathing across the eyes of a blackout diver can help initiate a breathing response? That was 60 seconds with me. What else don't you know? My name is Ted Hardy, the founder of Immersion Freediving, and I want to do more to stop the needless fatalities from shallow water blackout than any other person on the planet. And that's why I created freedivingsafety.com. Lucky for you, I made it very easy to get up to speed. You can learn how to reduce your risk of having a blackout, how to save your buddy's life, how to tell if you're wearing too much weight, and avoid breathing techniques that drastically increase your risk of having a blackout, and it's all for free. Go to freedivingsafety.com and sign up for my free safety course. Dive safe out there. It's not even that hard, especially when you learn for free at freedivingsafety.com. Dave, let's get into um, some species. Like, what well, where you like? You kind of getting around a little bit around the sort of southern end of Australia. What's a species you consistently like to target? Like something that maybe pushes you a little bit, gives you a, a bit of challenge. Something that you've had to really figure out over a few years. Uh, I really enjoy targeting flathead. They're a, they're. They're never a, a given. Like you can, I can dive areas where I go, this is a slam dunk. I'm going to come in with a with a beautiful big flathead here, and so many times you come out of the water empty, and you're just like, why weren't they there? What's what's? And I I really like that challenge. Yeah. Um, and there there is techniques that you can use. Like I mentioned it briefly earlier, like you know, dropping a bit of burly on the sand sand lines and stuff like that is is a really good way of um of getting yourself a flathead. Um. What are, what are the um, what are the main species you get down that that end? Like what are and how do you distinguish them? And because they've got different size limits too, don't they? Uh, as in the different species of flathead. Yeah, uh, they all it? they all come under the same size limit. Okay. Um, all the all the ones we get in SA anyway. Um, so they have to be thirty, I think it is from memory, which I I would never. Nah. Yeah, you know, unless it was in a unless it was in a competition setting and a, and I needed one, I, I wouldn't shoot one that was that small. Um, uh, to a, target the sort of it's like a whiting fillet when you're that small it's like yeah why, why would yeah, you do it yeah. you'd rather let them breed and carry on growing. yeah yeah that's it so yeah it, 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 we get we get primarily the southern uh sorry the blue spot blue spot flathead the southern blue spotted um we do get sand flathead rock flathead Grassies. There's a few different, a few different species that we get down here, but primarily the ones that I enjoy chasing the most are just the just those blue spots that hide in the weed, hide in the sand. When you when you see a, a nice big two and a half kilo, like nice slugs, uh, blue spot flathead come out of the weed and start chomping on a bit of burley, like you just laid down for it. It's pretty pretty rewarding when you when you get a reward for effort like that. And sometimes it takes. It takes half an hour. Like I did a did a club dive a couple of well, it was late late last year, I think it was, um, with the with a few guys from the club, and I had had my boat full of full of new new spiros, and so I thought I'd show them show them the technique that I use for, for getting the flathead, and found a nice sand line, and went anchored the boat up, and went swim with me, and I'll, I'll show you what I do. I'll show you how big to cut because. This is the other thing is you depending on whether you're diving in an area with current or no current or where, where you actually are, that will determine how big you, you cut your burly slices. So like if you're in a real still little bay 
you can afford to really shave that burly right down and have like a real thin scattering over the bottom. Whereas if you're diving in an area that has a bit of bit of current, bit of tide pushing through, you might need to cut sort of good good chunks of fish off and there's whole big chunks sitting on the bottom that aren't getting washed away in the, in the current. Um, so I swam with these guys and it took took quite a while. Like I was back and forth along the sand line, probably a 200 metre stretch, you know, cut up two or three fish and, and just let them, let them sit there. And I was swimming back and forward, back and forward and just couldn't believe that the flathead hadn't come out for, for this fish yet. And the guy, the other guys were getting a little bit bored. So they, they turned around and swam back to the boat. And I was, I was going to go as well. And I thought, I'll do, I'll just do one more lap on my own. And sure enough, the one lap that I did on my own, there, there he was sitting out on the sand. I just, just shook my head, just going, I'll be swimming back and forward with these, with this group of guys wanting to show them exactly this for half an hour. And, you know, right at the end, that one more lap was what brought it undone. But I find, I find that, that sort of hunting good fun and, and challenging. It's not a, not always a given that you're going to, you're going to get one, um, but I also love love chasing um, rockling, rockling over on uh, in, in areas where you know where you know they're there. They're like a they're like an eel that lives in a cave, and they'll off, often be a little sandy bottomed cave. And they're quite demersal. They'll um, usually once you find them, they won't move, which makes them a, a quite a good comp species, okay. um, especially in especially in areas like like Kangaroo Island. Um, because you can scout and you, I, and you got to cut. I, I do have a I do have a good story about a rockling as well. We um I was diving a <coughs> diving a state titles might have been 2013 over on over on Kangaroo Island might have been a little bit later than that. Anyway, I I spent a few days scouting and I was at this spot that was highly likely to be a comp zone for the for the upcoming comp. And when you're scouting that area, a rockling is is a fish that you do want to do want to lock down early. You want to so if you can scout them out and find one in the in the few days leading up to the comp, chances are it's still going to be sitting there on on comp day. And um, and and Rob Rob Torelli was there this year, and I, I knew that he had been scouting the same areas. And obviously, there's a little bit of a little bit of a rivalry there. He's he's <laughs> he's um, you know, always always the guy to beat, even on your even on your home turf like Kangaroo Island. Um, and I was swimming along this this beach one day, and I was I was about five. Probably five hundred meters away from where the where the start of the comp would be, and I just saw I, I was looking for rockling. I, I, had, I hadn't got one yet, and I just came across a little area, and it was just a slightly out of place rock. And as I saw it and just went, that, "That rock's weird. What's going on there?" And there was there was a bit of a cavey sort of section nearby, and I had a look under the ledge. Sure enough, under this ledge, there's this there's this dirty big rockling sitting there. So that. That obviously Robert scout like I straight away knew what had happened. He'd scouted out that rock land, put this rock in a position where where he would recognise it. And I was like, all right, this is this is good. And I, so I took <laughs> <laughs> so I took 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 marks on it and not GPS marks, landmarks. And and anyway, a couple of days later at the start of the comp, we're all, we're all lined up on the beach, and I, I I know how Rob dives, and he knows he knows the area as well as I do, and being only 500 metres or so from the start point, that was hands down going to be the first fish that he was going to go for. He was going to, he was going to clip his gun off and, and overarm it to that ling, get the ling off the board early. Mm. And then, <laughs> and, um, and we, were, we, were, uh, we were side by side, deliberately positioned myself next to him on the beach. And, and obviously he didn't know that I knew that he had this ling there. And we, we kicked off the beach and, <laughs> and we were just side by side. The whole way, it was, it was, it was a swim where we sort of, you could see the moment that the penny dropped that, that I was going for the same fish that he was going for. And he, for his, for his age and, and, you know, to his credit, he, he can bloody swim. And he, he's a, especially when he, he's more competitive than, than anyone, especially yeah. when he knows that you're going for the same thing that he's going for. Like, so we were about two or three meters away from each other, both guns clipped off and both just, just, over armoring, powering towards this fish, and you know, glancing, like side eyeing at each other, and then side eyeing at the land, like getting our getting our marks lined up, and a five hundred meter swim. It's quite a long when way. When you're going that hard, yeah, it it you're absolutely stuffed. And we we both got to the spot at exactly the same. We were side by side, shoulder to shoulder, the whole way to this spot. As soon as we got to the spot, I sucked. You know, probably with my age, slightly fitter. 
um, I just sucked a sucked a breath of air and and it wasn't particularly deep. Just sucked a breath of air and and dived down and he dived at the same time and you know, <laughs> tried tried to tried to white at me sort of like kicked up a bit of sand trying to disturb the viz and all that sort of stuff and and I, I didn't have time for my eyes to adjust and obviously my heart rate absolutely through the roof. Um, you know, hit the bottom and I was trying to trying to let my eyes adjust in this cave while positioning my gun in a way that I can sort of get it and, and Rob's beside me, you know, kicking up a bit of sand, trying to trying to make sure that I couldn't couldn't adjust and see it and all this sort of stuff and end up not not getting it on that dive and we both came up to the surface and and um and from memory he he took a breath before me and went back down and and actually got it. Oh. And uh, I was just, uh, yeah <laughs> the old the old the old, the old fox out out outwitted me, um, uh, but luckily there there was another one in a in a cave about two meters away that I actually didn't didn't know was there when he when he was dispatching that one. I had a quick look around the area and, and managed to find find another one which I didn't have scouted. It was it was a little bit smaller, but it was a it was a consolation prize. But um, but yeah, just a that a- that is that is the epitome of what I absolutely love about comp spearing especially with a with a rival where you just you're both going for the same fish and yeah, you know, right. one of you one of you is going to miss out <laughs> man that's a good story that's a good yarn five minute uh, a 500 meter swim it's a good four minute flat out dash and uh i can imagine your co2 is like just like right up there when you went to make that dive that's a 25 second dive i reckon Flat out. Oh yeah, I reckon it. I reckon it probably wasn't even that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff. Yeah. Love it. Um, but yeah, rock, rockling, rockling are a good, good, fun southern species to chase. Then at their, you know, yeah, I, I enjoy, I enjoy targeting them. Long so, answer to your question there, Shrek. But no, nah, love it, love it. So triangulation with landmarks is a is a bit of a skill. Um, give me an idea about how you. Because some people have got a better sense of direction than others. Some people have got an almost freakish sense of direction. I am kind of uh, more of a thinker rather than a, like an intuitive type directions guy. Like if someone goes, where's north? I have to think. I don't just go, oh, north's there. Um, walk me through navigating to a spot where you've scouted. Um, uh, what type of guy are you? Are you a guy that intuitively knows direction or are you someone that has to think about it too? Uh, I would say that I intuitively know most of the time. I don't always get it right. There is times when I'll think that I'm going one way and I'm definitely going the other. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, especially in areas where I would use landmarks and stuff like that in a comp, I, I 100% know which way is north. Um, yeah. You, yeah. If you if you're in inside a land, I, I don't. I know um, a lot of people take compass bearings and you know you. you you swim this far on this bearing, and, and that that can be okay. I've I've never really worked like that. Um, I I'll generally try to line up and know an object, a, a white rock on the beach with a with a tree behind it, in in a you know preferably three three positionings. You know one to the one to the east, for example, one to the south, and one to the southwest. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, if, and if if you can do that, you you'll pretty much get yourself within Kuwe of a spot and. And if you've dived, if you've scouted that spot, and if you've dived it enough, you'll you'll recognise things on the bottom. Um, you know whether it's a, a funny coloured weed, coloured rock, or or something like that. Um, you know, or you can always do the always do the sneaky and, and flip over. As soon as you flip over a rock, the colour underneath for for a week or so will always stand out. It'll always be a different colour to the um, you know to the growth on top. So so scouting, like you might have these species that are like. Very territorial within a within a known cave. Um, what are some of the other sc- scouting features that you use? So, like, I'm imagining you know certain species like to feed and certain current behaviours. So you you maybe you're looking at an avionics and you suss out where your pressure points are, and or maybe if you've got a better idea because you're a local, you might already know all this stuff. Um, walk me through your rough scouting plan. So you've got a species list. So like. If I can be a little bit unfair, like we're going to the nationals next year over in uh, W in Dunsborough, um, you probably know the three locations that are likely to be our comp zones. Walk me through, if you can. You don't have to give everything away, but like I think I'm going to get one or perhaps two days of scouting, which is crap if you want to be actually competitive. But walk me through how you think I should spend those two days. Big question. Um, big question. 
I know it's a bit shit at short notice. Yeah. Any any time scouting a location, it doesn't matter. Like obviously, usually on a shore based competition like a nationals, you can either go left or you can go right. You can go east, you can go west. Like that's pretty much you know your directions you're going to go. Like there's only so far you can swim straight out before you, yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> um, and and generally in a competition, there's going to be a fishy direction and a and a not so fishy direction, and that may change from day to day as well. So it's not always a not always a slam dunk, but any any time that you spend scouting, it doesn't matter whether you swim the right way or the wrong way. The, what you will learn those days about fish behaviour, the local species, how they how they like to behave, is going to be so much better than not doing it. So it doesn't matter whether you actually scout, um, you know, an individual fish. It doesn't matter whether you get whether you like your real top guys that spend three months there or, or whatever prior or the guys that know the area really well they might know a rock they'll go yeah under that i swim to this rock i'm going to get a jewfish or i'm going to going to get this or that you know that's that's where the experience in a in a competition marianne told me a long time ago it takes three things to win a competition third a third skill a third local knowledge and a third luck and that 100% 100% rings true in pretty much every competition that I've ever dived. I've never, ever won a competition without some degree of all three of those things. Yeah, right. And and luck always comes. It doesn't matter whether you're the best diver there who has the most no, local knowledge. If you don't get lucky, you're still not going to win the comp. Mm. But what you're doing by scouting is you're, you know, you're not going to improve your skill. You're not going to improve your luck on the day. But what you are going to improve is to some degree your local knowledge. So any time, whether it's one day, whether it's two days, always spend that time doing the scouting. Yeah, and that's something that that I put down to, you know, what definitely affected um, in the 2019 nationals um, in Port Ferry. I, I won, I won the first day, and I backed it up by winning the second day. So on day two, I was on 200 percent, and on the third day, there was a rest day in between, and instead of spending that day scouting like I should have I I opted to rest my body and just have a just have a rest day I thought you know and in hindsight that was a bad call I really shouldn't have done that I should have spent that day because the the comp zone for the third day which I knew what it was going to be I didn't know it well enough to um you know to to win the comp and I ended up losing the entire comp on the third day Oh, to, dirty. To Rob, to Rob, to Rob Torelli. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he was, but he was, but he was out there the day before scouting it. Yeah. You know, and that, and that's something that, that's something that you learn. The more you do it, doesn't, you know, I thought that I would have been better off having a rest day and resting my body. But in hindsight, I needed to spend that day learning that area. And I, I, I I'm, Quite confident that if I had done that, I probably would have found I would have learnt something that I didn't utilise on the comp day. Okay, cool. In terms of physical prep, like I am, uh, I'm carrying around my dad bod most days of the week. Uh, you know, lifestyle, if I'm honest, is pretty hectic. Um, <laughs> in terms of getting prepped for a comp, fitness wise and stuff, what 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 do you do? Uh, a lot of cardio. Just, just me. I, I like cardio. I like running. Um, I, you know, cardio and time in the water. That's my hundred percent prep for a comp. Okay. Hydration. Even if it's not time. Cramping. Do you cramp? How old are you, Dave? Uh, I, I'm 38. Oh yeah. I don't get a don't get a whole lot of cramping. Um, but again, I think that comes down to spending a lot of time swimming. I think if if you don't spend enough time in the water. You know, you're more likely to suffer those sorts of ailments. So if you're wanting to take a national competition seriously, even if it's not in the competition zones, even if you don't have access to the to the water, if you're inland, you're going to have a pool nearby. There's going to be something. You know, do some cardio, get yourself get yourself fit to to, to the best of your ability, and and just do laps. Start swimming. Swim with your fins. Get your yeah. get your leg muscles used to what's going to happen because yeah. most of the time especially in a national competition you, you're going to have to swim there's probably going to be currents and you're going to come back in from that day having swum harder than what you have 
in any of your recreational dives leading up yeah. to it. So okay, yeah. All right. I'm just I'm thinking of pity for my for my buddy. <laughs> he did invite me though. Uh shout out to Tom Sandstrom. Um so I don't know why he maybe just wanted to tow someone around the day and give himself a handicap. <laughs> uh, old Tom will probably do probably do all right over uh, there. He, so would, you, he you, probably you. would have done all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can just see myself going, Oh look. Tom, I'll, I'll carry your, your fish bag, bro, and just swim after you flat out. <laughs> nah, we'll have fun. I'm sure it'll be good anyway. It'll be good just to meet a whole bunch of people too. I think it'll um, it'll be an interesting competition. I, I haven't done one of the nationals in the in the pairs format yet, so it's going to be it'll be a bit of a learning so, learning curve for me as well. So my understanding, you can have one float, one float line between, yeah, or you have to, and then you have. One five meter line off it is that right, or three meter line? I think I read, and then yeah, I, I, I'm not sure exactly on what the ruling is with the length of the float line, but yeah, there's one one long, one short float line. Yeah, who's your buddy? Sam Dawson. Oh, you guys are going to be competitive, eh? Uh, it, it's anyone's it's anyone's comp down there. It really is. Yeah. I, I certainly am not going into it remotely confident. Who's it's partnered with Rob? To- who's partnered with Rob? I don't. I don't know if Rob's going to go. He's um, oh. yeah. Haven't haven't heard from him yet. So <laughs> <laughs> he's going to ambush you on the day. Probably get some foreign European weapon out for the day or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if he if he turns up, he'll be a menace as usual. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Something about just competitive yeah, um, competitive blokes. It's a lot of fun. The smack talk is good. Yeah, too. yeah. You know, if Bryson and if Bryson and Tim pull their finger out and decide to um come to the come to the dark side and swim a bit of um, dirty temperate water, they could they could definitely make a bit of a nuisance of themselves as well. So yeah, see if definitely. they can see if they can back up their national title. Oh <laughs> that's a bit of smack talk there. I like it. Ah <laughs> uh, yeah, good stuff. Purely hey. direct purely directed towards Bryson. I don't I don't know Tim personally, but I'll ah. I'll happily smack talk Bryson. Yeah, that's the way. That's the way. <laughs> Just quickly, we we forgot to t- um, cover off a major talking point, which was um, the overturning of a of a ban. Walk me through that just quickly. Yeah, so there was a um, along the Adelaide Metro Coast. There's been for for my lifetime, there's been a ban on spear fishing. You're not allowed to spear within 600 meters of the high water mark between Outer Harbour, which is sort of down the, down near Port Adelaide, but north of Adelaide essentially, um, all the way south to where a river comes out. But so basically oh. takes out the entire Adelaide metro area. You're not allowed to shore dive it and you know, you know, not allowed to dive it within 600 metres of the high water mark. And it's always been a, a pretty – I've always seen it as highly discriminatory. Oh, 100%. Um, you know, because a, a lot of the areas are super – they always they always cite, you know, oh, swimmer's safety and, and all of that sort of stuff because some of those beaches are, you know, pretty popular swimming beaches mm. um and in in 2000 not not long after forming the forming golf skin divers um there was a there was a bit of a change in south australian government and as part of that the peak recreational fishing body got stood down and uh, uh and what was called the minister's recreational fishing advisory council was was formed and there was only two members of the public um or two male members of the public that were eligible to to sit on this committee after the after the ones that automatically got put on there, um, and one of my one of my best mates sent me an email and said, "Mate, you need to you need to go for this. Like, try to try to get on that meeting and uh, get on that committee and and you know be a, be a bit of a voice for the for the spiros on there." Oh. And um, so we ran it. We ran a pretty big pretty big campaign, and 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 it was pretty impressive. Like all the spiros just like. All over the place, banded together, and it was an online vote. Like there was all local fishing personalities trying to get on there, and um, you know some pretty pretty well known people. And no one knew who the who the hell I was. Like I was just some some bloody random. And, um, and yeah, we ended up end up getting in. Um, managed to get voted on purely thanks to the Spiros who who um, you know they were, they were getting their mums and their dads and their entire <laughs> family to vote. And it, was, it, it ended up being a bit of yeah, like the the ministers, the minister's assistant. I, I had a meeting with the minister's assistant before I got voted on, and and 
it was pretty obvious from just talking to her that I was in the running. Because she was like, yeah. who, "Who are you, and what's what's going? Like, how how, you, how are you running your campaign? How are you getting people to vote for you, and this and that?" And I just yeah. I just replied like, "Well, I represent the spearfishers, and we're we're sick and tired of being ignored, basically." Love and, it. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, and they they you know she sort of raised an eyebrow and was like, "Oh, okay." Like she probably didn't even know what spearfishing was, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, anyway, as a result of that. Um, got onto this onto this council and sort of bided my time for a couple of years and there wasn't a whole lot of stuff happening and then and then I spoke to the spoke to the minister and I spoke to her his assistant again and said look there's this there's this thing that's bothering me about this about this ban along the Metro Adelaide coast what's my what's my best way to go about because most of the meetings were just taken up with just all the jargon stuff it wasn't really relevant to spear fishing and I, I was pretty keen to actually have a bit of an impact there. And she said, "Mate, you just have to like raise it, raise it as a as a talking point in the meeting, and then and then let's go from there." And so I did that, and just had full support of the of the entire committee. They were like, "Yep, all right, let's let's um, work on this." And it and it just snowballed from there. Oh, that's bloody to the awesome. point that to the point that I started actually believing that it was gonna that it was possibly gonna happen. And there was I forget how it ended up coming about, but it. Long long story short, basically there was some consultation with key stakeholders, which which came back um, overwhelmingly positive, which mm-hmm. was which was really good. By the time that that it all got all got passed through, we managed to open up a, a fairly significant chunk, so Hallett Cove and Merino Rocks. It's an area that isn't frequented by a lot of swimmers, but it is quite good, quite good diving. And but yeah, it was, it's it's a bit of a bit of a good news story about how you know if you if you have a bit of a crack and if you have the support of, of the people, which the, the spearfishing community here were just unbelievable in what they what they did. Firstly, rallying to get me onto the committee, um, and secondly, their support of the the whole process and um, and you know getting getting something like that overturned and, and opened up for spearos is almost almost unheard of, really. Um, Mad- Magic, love the story. I, I, yeah. I field emails from people in the opposite situation so much, and it's so good to hear a positive story where we rallied together and someone stuck their hand up. You probably underplayed your hand there. You were sitting on that advisory council for two years, building goodwill, no doubt, and just being yourself. So then, when you finally did put something forward, you had a lot of people, friendly people, a lot of friendly faces that were not. Um, you were not antagonistic towards, and they were probably far more open to hearing what you had to say, which is pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, a, a bloke, uh, Bradman, up up at the Fraser Coast, they're dealing with extended green zone uh, plans there. And, you know, their um, local spearing community, there's a bunch of sort of guys that are sort of talking together and trying to do stuff. But, when you know, this is one of the cool things clubs can do. They can draw people in together. And then it gives us a far better and bigger voice to have in these um, these corridors of power, if you like. Um, well 100%, done, hundred percent. Powers power of power of numbers. Like if it wasn't for if it wasn't for everyone getting behind me, there's no way that we would have got it through. And I, I still scratch my head as to how we actually did, to be honest with you. But at Bloody the end of the day, awesome. we did. So <laughs> love it. Today's podcast is brought to you by Killshot Spear Guns. Ed Martin makes dependable, reliable, simple spear guns that you can rely on. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. But it's not just me saying it. Have a listen to what this bloke's got to say about it. Well, I just love Ed Martin's Killshot Spear Guns. They just shoot fish all day long. But it's not just the Americans saying it. He's even sold some spear guns in the UK. That's right, Shrek. I just love a kill shot spear gun. I've been shooting bass and all sorts of cod and pollock and God knows what down here in the loch and around and uh, the end of my accent. But uh, yeah, I love kill shot spear guns. Keep them coming, Ed. And uh, even the Australians are getting in on it. Ed makes a quality, reliable uh, platform. Have a listen to what um, Stu had to say when I got hold of him last time. Oh, joy, Shrek, I got on to bloody kill shot spear guns last time I heard you gobbing on about them on the podcast and I just got on I wanted a reliable uh, bloody uh, tough spear gun so I got on kill shot I saved I used the code the bloody uh, noob code there the nooba 
and on killshotspearguns.com. Got myself an American bit of my, uh, timber spear gun and jeepers, mate. This thing is shooting crocs. Oh, oh this it's so bloody good, mate. Uh, don't don't listen to me about the crocs, say it's illegal, but I do like to shoot the odd bearer. <laughs> Get on to them. Get into them. I'm out. See you, mate. You didn't just hear it from me. Buy American-made performance at killshotspearguns.com. Get $30 off any spear gun when you use the code NUBA on killshotspearguns.com. Freediving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold, understand your body better, and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program is not for noobs, as this program is for people who have some diving under their belts and understand some basic spearfishing safety, but... It's perfect for Spiros who want a guided, easy to follow and complete program with videos, a clear process and a set goal. The 5 Minute Freediver works. Get started for free and see if it's for you at howtofreedive.com. There's a tester there. Use the code NOOBSPIRO, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O to save some money if you do decide to purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. Freediving for spearfishers, a fantastic way to prepare, especially if you've got a big trip coming up. Get to that 5 minute mark and it does translate to your diving at howtofreedive.com. Let's change gears a wee bit. Toughest situation, Dave. Something that um, maybe a, a time where you've scared the crap out of yourself. Um, learned something. I haven't. I haven't. I haven't got one off the top of my head for you there. To be honest, I'm a, I'm a relatively conservative diver. I've I haven't. I've never blacked out, and I don't push myself to the point that I think that I might. So yep. I've never really had a you know. Too many close calls where I go, oh wow, that was that was really dumb. Or current, or, current you know. swell, boats, sharks. Uh yeah, there, there was there was one time I guess I was I was diving a diving a competition in Port Ferry, and on this day there was a fair bit of swell coming in over the over the reef. You've got these sheltered um, lagoons there, and if you if you stay in the lagoon, you're reasonably safe. If you do push out the back, you can. You can get hit by a bit of current on this on this particular day. Swell was up, and it was a bit borderline as to whether it was going. If you get out the back, it can be really fishy, um, and obviously most people stay in the lagoons because it's clearer and, and safer. Um, but but being competitive, I, I hedged my bets and decided to push out the back. and And I, I got out there, and there was a really strong, um, really strong current pushing uh, east to west, and and I, I fished it. I fished it and sort of did, did okay, and but sort of just went with the current. But then once I got further down the coast, there, there's a spot where I know you can cut in. But from being where I was, and with the swell being so big, it was breaking right across, and I couldn't actually pick where the entrance was. Oh, wow. and that's something that looking from the shore, you can always see it. Like there's 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 always a little little break there, a little uh, little section where the where the swell doesn't break, and the swell down that way can be pretty. Can be pretty wild, and if you if you misjudge it, it's not deep. Like you're gonna get you're gonna get pounded on Ooh. on rocks. Um, good old basalt boulders, um, and it took it it, it it probably is one of those times that I was a little bit rattled. I was out out the back in you know probably 15 meters of water and on my own, no one anywhere near me, and I just sat out there just watching the sweat sets come through, and there was just no no break. I couldn't I couldn't read it. And you know, being at being at water level, it's so much harder to actually see what you're meant to do, and and it, it's one of those one of those things that you you go shit. I could have really done myself a mischief there if I had, and and fortunately I did manage to pick. I, I don't know how, and I'm not sure why I picked the line that I picked, but it was it was a pretty much a pure hail mary. That going, I think it's here, but I definitely don't know that it's here, shit. and and managed to managed to get in. But um, yeah, without without losing all my fish either, which was even better. But nice, nice, <laughs> um, yeah, because that would. But yeah, it, compound it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's definitely one of those things. Don't don't. Yeah, don't overestimate your ability ever. Like I, I'd, Hindsight's twenty twenty, but like I'm thinking about that. Like you made the call to do it to 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 go it. Um, looking back on it, would you do the same thing again? Uh I, I would 
I probably would, to be honest with you. I, I you know, I like to have back myself a little bit and hedge my bets, and you, you know, but I would probably, I, I definitely think more about it when I'm in that area now, knowing how difficult it is mm. to to read read that entrance again. Are you? You definitely, it's something that you, you don't really think about until, like, I didn't think about it that day. Like, I thought, if I can get out, I'll be fine. Yeah. But coming coming back in and being able to, unable to read what that swell is doing and where the safe safe spot is, it's something I didn't think about until, which I would think about now. I would go, like, I might, you know, pay more attention from shore in the morning and go, oh, yeah, this is this is what the tides are doing. And there's there's there would be things that I'd be able to adjust to make it a little bit safer, like, yeah, right. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, you could have someone maybe up on a high spot that could signal you somehow, um, but, like, it's yeah. at a certain time, you know, like, you, you, you're you on your dive watch, yeah. you're like, sweet, I'm going to come in at 11. Uh, I don't know, but it'd still be hard, like, to, um, you know, if you, if you are coming in at the wrong spot, it's just like, wow. Yeah, hectic. definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, funny stuff. I'd love to hear... Uh, here a time where, <laughs> um, I, again, I, I haven't got a whole lot off the top of my head. Um, the, the there's so many stories that, that you that you think of when you when you're diving, and there's heaps of funny stuff that happens all the time. Like all all spiros just have have so many funny stories. But one thing that does come to mind, I, I remember my first ever dive with 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 Sam when we when we first met. We talked on the phone a couple of times. We both worked out. We were both mad keen and and you know into the comp well wanted to be into the competition at that stage i'd never dived to competition sam was this little little grubby 15 year old he didn't have his car license and um got got dropped off in the car park with his mum and um or by his mum and, and i was a little bit older so i drove myself there but i had no gear i was, I was diving out of a like wearing a surf wetsuit like just a total like proper proper noob like didn't barely even had a decent gun and no float, no, no decent fins, using scuba fins. And But at the time, I was a bit cautious about sharks. So I, I, I'm not very handy, Freck. I, I'm, Sam will attest to that, that I'm not, I'm not a handy man. Okay. And I'm not very good with my gear. Um, but I'd fashioned up this little plastic crate, like one of those plastic crates you buy from Bunnings. Mm. And I'd put some rods through the bottom of it and had a couple of or four styrofoam buoys attached to the rods. That was my spearfishing float. Far out. That's it. And, uh, <laughs> You're not pulling that pretty, through, pretty smell. Ag- <laughs> pretty, ag- pretty agricultural. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we rocked up to – rocked up. this was the first time I'd ever met Sam. And anyone that knows Sam knows that he doesn't mince his words <laughs> um, very much when it comes to things that he doesn't like, and he's pretty anal with his gear. <laughs> And he'd beat her out a little bit. He'd, be, he'd done a competition by this stage, so he had the good wetsuit, he had the good fins, and the good float, and, and all this sort of stuff. And I got out, got out of my car. And it's a miracle that he dives dives with me again. To be honest with you, after after me rocking up, I open up my boot and I get out this bloody monstrosity of a float and put it on the ground. And I can still remember Sam just looking at it. I was I was about. I think I was twenty at this stage. I was a little bit older, and, and Sam was fifteen. And he just looked at me this little snotty nose bloody 15 year old kid and just goes what the fuck is that <laughs> <laughs> I was like oh, it's my, this, this is my dive float and he, he just he was just shaking his head was guy, like, that, that, is, that is the worst thing that I've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think I used it again after that time. But um, yeah, it got hit. But it is a funny story. It is a funny story about you know where you. Where you start off and the yeah. things that you start with, and and you know, not everyone starts off with the most fandangled fancy gear. I, I thought I was being pretty clever, getting my fish out of the water with my with my little homemade float boat. But <laughs> yeah, and that that float boat will be buried in the closet of shame. Have you got any photos of it? Oh, I don't think I do. Oh, Unfortunately, I'd bloody love. Man. I would actually love to have a photo of it, but no, I don't think I do. It'd make you laugh. <laughs> It'd make you laugh. We all start yeah. somewhere, eh? And I. I, yep. I like people that just have a crack and have an idea and try and make something too. But yeah, sometimes people try and reinvent the wheel too, which is another thing. It's like, but you've got to make do with what you have sometimes. So all good. Yeah, mm. yeah. No, that thing was a that thing was a true shocker. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
We're going to have a faster paced round of questions to head on out, Dave, and then uh, I'm going to ask you how people can come and find and connect with you. Um, let's get into it, eh? Spiro Q&A. Go for it. Here we go. Um, single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? Uh, time in the water. Time. time in the water. All right, cool. Um, current, what, what, what current challenges do you face with your spearing and how are you approaching them? Uh, probably enthusiasm. As you get older, you lose a bit of enthusiasm. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot easier to, to sit at home on the couch than than get keen to go out and get cold and and you know, die of miserable conditions. But um, <clears throat> I would say, yeah, that's that's probably my number one challenge. But every every single time that you go, no, I am going to go for a dive, you never regret it. Mm. So you just got to keep on keep on charging. All right, two questions, um, two left. What what would be your fish of a lifetime? Your dream fish? Uh, probably a blue marlin or a hapuka or a swordfish. Oh, do you do you get harpooker off off where you are? Uh, you do, but certainly yeah. out of my diving depth. Hundreds of meters, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the mar- yeah. the marlin's on a lot of people's lists, particularly when people <laughs> Uh, have seen how fast they grow and all that sort of stuff. They're amazing fish. Yeah, uh, just 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 hearing just hearing the stories of the guys that I know that, that have shot a blue. They they sound like they're they're absolute freight trains and and pretty challenging. You know, I've shot a I have shot a stripe, um, and that was a lot of fun. But um, the the blues seemed like a bit of a bit of a different different kettle of fish. Not mm. so much of a slam dunk if you get them in the right mood. Last question. Could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one or two sentences? Uh, I find the spearfishing experience super rewarding in every single sense of the word. Like it, that it's it's structured my entire life. Rewarding. Nice. One word. That's cool. I love it. That's awesome, Dave. Mate, some really good info and stuff in this in this yarn. I, I hope people have taken a fair bit away from it. From um, Strategically taking a kid spearfishing to um, thinking about scouting um, some of your iconic um, South Australian species and, and the environment, including the club, the Gulf Skin Divers. Massive shout out to all of the people in your club and um, and Todd who kept pestering me to get me get you on. Uh, shout out to him. He was uh, very persuasive, but he's not the only person who have asked for you to come on the show as well. So it's a like I said at the start, it's been a long time coming. Uh, you did not disappoint, mate. Dave Schofield, everyone. Where can people come and connect with you, brother? Uh, Scoey Dave on Instagram. I don't post a whole lot. Um, ha- if you want to go and have a look at a bit of footage of um, shooting a striped marlin, I do have a video on YouTube. If you search my name, Dave Schofield and spearfishing striped marlin or something like that, it should come up with a bit, bit of a video on, on YouTube there of a 108-kilo stripey that I shot a little oh, while back. But, that's um, a big one. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was good good fun, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll link that up in today's show notes. So, again, like, um, and hopefully I can get an image of one of those, uh, the harlequin fish down there as well. But it'll be noobspirit.com forward slash Dave. I'll link up your Instagram, your YouTube, and, as well as the golf skin divers down there as well. So, awesome, Dave. Legend, Shrek. Thanks heaps for your time, mate. I appreciate you having me on. Well, guys, what did you think of the last episode of 2023? Dave Schofield, an absolute gentleman. Awesome hearing about South Australia and some of the cool stuff going, some of the successes they've had. And um, I really liked his deliberate and strategic approach to teaching his daughter spearfishing. I think there's a lot in it for any of us Spiro dads out there uh, that are wanting to teach our kids and give them that passion and do it in a very deliberate and intentional way. So I thought that was an awesome section of um, of the interview today. Hey guys, um, as usual, massive thanks again and a Merry Christmas to all you guys that listen to the podcast. Uh, thanks for sharing the show with your mates. Every little bit helps guys and I am uh, hugely appreciative. The show has grown, grown from strength to strength. And um, what are we, 200 and something episodes deep these days? It's absolutely crazy. Massive thanks to the patrons helping to put fuel in the Noob Spiro outboard. Patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro if you want to check that out and do that in the new year. All good, guys. Um, I'll see you back in 2024. I've got Prime Hall. Um, he is not a Spiro, but he is an ex-Mavsoc Raider. 
Uh, he created a brand new underwater sport over there called the Underwater Torpedo League. If it was in my area, I'm telling you, I would be sorely tempted to carve some time out and go and do it because it looks so fun. Uh, but massive focus on mental health, how to live with, with trauma and how being part of a cool sort of community can help you um, put support systems around yourself. And uh, I thought it was a cool one to open up with the new year. So uh, that'll be our first episode coming back sort of mid early to mid January. So come back, see me there. Uh, guys, again, Merry Christmas. That's me for 2023. Noob Sparrow podcast over and out. I used to get told there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. But I found out that there are actually three. Score a free hat of your choice when you use the code Noob Sparrow with every purchase of over $100 at noobsparrow.com forward slash taxman. Get some gear that's nearly guaranteed to drive away the wokesters, but gain admiration from the fishing fraternity. Go to noobsparrow.com forward slash taxman and use the code at Noob Sparrow when you spend $100 or more to get yourself a free hat. Again, noobsparrow.com forward slash taxman. <laughs> this review for adreno.com.au from Brett, particularly the Woolongabba Adreno Superstore. I started spearfishing more regularly recently and Adreno not only has everything I need, it has Paul. He's super helpful, knowledgeable and kits me out each time with gear that I actually use. Paul has also provided me with heaps of tips that have made my dives better and more fruitful. He has the friendliest vibe and I would happily empty out my account upon every visit. I never write reviews and I used to buy gear online but have now found in-store is much better. That review from Brett, it's up on Google if you want to check it out. Adreno.com.au, one of the longest running partners of the Noob Sparrow podcast. Use the code Noob Sparrow to save $20. In-store, online, go to Adreno.com.au. Massive superstores, huge range of gear. Check it out. Absolutely mint customer service. Specialty spearfishing equipment, elite spear gun performance components, unforgettable reliability. You want to find out where to buy this? Punchaneptonics.com and shop at the best US spearfishing store. Neptonics.com. Free shipping to the lower 48 when you spend over 199 and you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. This is your chance to save DOSH. Buy deadly good gear and experience A-grade customer service. Will you shop with the best? Visit naptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to start shooting 35 pound muttons tomorrow. Actual performance may differ from advertisement. Please refer to terms and conditions to see if you're eligible to be a legend like Shrek. This advertisement was not even endorsed by Jerry and the team at Neptonics. Hoorah and God bless America.